Our first presenter is Professor Pam McCausland, um, who is a professor of psychology in our Department of Behavioral Sciences. And she's going to talk to you about modeling media's influence on rape myth acceptance and reactions to sexual assault. Pam. Thank you. So I'm Pam McCausland, and I'm going to be telling you about um, our media's influence on rape myth acceptance and uh, the reactions to a sexual assault victim. Um, media often subtly or not so subtly um, reinforces attitudes that accept and sometimes even actually encourage sexual violence. Um, and the media we use um, sometimes, depending on what we see, is uh, that we see that women who've been sexually assaulted are often mistreated or disbelieved. A conservative estimate is that one in every six American women has experienced attempted or completed rape. Although men are sometimes the victims of sexual assault, about 95% of victims are women. Negative consequences include increased rates of both physical and mental health issues, and this happens over the short term and the long term. We know that negative reactions that victims receive when they've been sexually assaulted has negative consequences on health. But less research has looked at the factors that lead to rape myth acceptance and that influence the reactions that the victims get. So the media practices model that we're using here basically says that these early life experiences, if I can do this, and individual characteristics influence the media factors. I'm going to talk about this more next. Um, let's just say it's not just about aggressive or sexual media consumption. That influences attitudes and then behavior. When someone identifies with media personalities, like the characters on Gossip Girl, they're often exposed to messages that promote both hypersexuality and hypermasculinity. Many young people look to the media and media personalities as a source of information about how they should look or act or dress. But identification always isn't always negative. This little girl is actually dressed up as her superhero RBG. So I, I have hope. <laughs> um, there's a large body of research that looks at consumption. We looked at consumption as both the amount of media people consume, but also we had people um, rate how much aggressive and sexual content they looked at in media. Um, and then there's a large body of research that looks at media's influence on aggressive um, or sexual or pro-social thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we also measured, um, we had questionnaires that um, assessed that. So now back to the start of the model. Um, we expect that early experiences, including things like trauma or experiencing or witnessing interpersonal violence, might have an influence on then the media factors. We also think that these individual personality characteristics like dogmatism, which is defined as, um, let's see, make sure I get this right, the tendency to see one's own beliefs as undeniably true without consideration of the evidence or other people's opinions. And um, we think that's also related to um, media factors. And then we come back to this. We think those early, in, um, early experiences, life factors, influence media, which influences rape myth acceptance. Um, rape myth acceptance is defined as attitudes and generally false beliefs about rape that are widely and persistently held. And then those attitudes influence reactions to a sexual assault. So I'm going to tell you about our latest research. Um, I'm working on this with Chaz Lynn Miller and Michelle Leonard. We conducted a longitudinal study of emerging adults from across the US. Um, we um, created the surveys using Qualtrics, and we recruited participants through um, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And this was supported by funding from campus grants as well as our graduate program. Um, the time one survey includes the measures of the trauma, dogmatism, rape myth acceptance, um, as well as media questionnaires and demographics. And then the second survey went out one month later. And this one asked participants to consider their reactions to three scenarios. But the one we're interested in was a scenario that um, was asking about a female friend who had disclosed that she'd been um, sexually assaulted by her boyfriend, forced her to have sex when she didn't want to. So our final sample is 507 emerging adults from across the US about half are female, about two-thirds Caucasian, majority employed, majority some college education. So now I hope I've given you enough that I can walk you through um, our results. This is our hypothesized structural model. Um, so we're basically feeding um, the stats program the way each of these variables is measured. 
and then we try and see if this hypothesized structural model fits with the actual data we have. Um, so we have um, trauma and dogmatism, we expect will predict media identification, predict more media consumption, rape myth acceptance, and then um, less positive, more negative reactions to victims. And when we look at the actual outcome, it, it did pretty well. Um, the only thing that didn't work was this trauma path didn't um, fit there, but all the other paths are statistically significant. The other interesting thing we can do with structural equation modeling is that we can look at the effects of early variables through the intervening variables on the outcomes. So in this case, um, dogmatism was really important. Greater dogmatism related to more media identification and then work through these other media variables and rape myth acceptance to relate to less positive and more negative reactions to victims. So um, we have to do a few things. We're going to finalize measures. Um, our measure of uh, media identification is really innovative, um, but we're not quite sure what we're, where we're going to focus it yet. And then the other thing we might do is move from kind of this traditional structural equation modeling into what's called exploratory structural equation modeling. You can see it's just really complicated, so we're not quite there yet. Um, the other thing that I haven't talked about yet is gender. And so you can see from this um, that I ran the model separately for males and females for just this one small portion of it. Media consumption and influence um, is related to rape myth acceptance much more strongly for men than it is for women. And so the next step is to really kind of parse this out and figure it out, but it's not just a simply a matter of looking at the two models separately. I have to do more complicated analysis. Um, so our implications for this, I think the one is to think about dogmatism and develop early interventions to really target um, fighting dogmatism and making people open for all ages. But the other idea would be to have our programs continue to fight rape myths and to make sure people intervene when they see something that um, they think is happening that's wrong and to be supportive of victims. Um, finally, media literacy is critically important now. I think we need to also do that really early. It's not just enough to say um, kids shouldn't be consuming aggressive or sexual media. I think it's really a matter of getting them to think about um, why and how they identify with particular media personalities and then how the media that they do consume can impact them in large ways, their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Thank you. So did I win the award? No. Nah. <laughs>